incubation period. Incubation period uh, long ranges have been given, but for all practical purpose, 16 to 18 days is considered to be the average common incubation period. Some infections are asymptomatic, they may be silent. Others will show mild non-specific illness, which will be similar to any viral infection, similar to other viral infections. So there will be some moderate grade fever, there will be sore throat, there will be some degree of myalgia, retroorbital pain, headache, irritability, malaise and then the few days later the child will improve. More typically, the typical infection will follow a set pattern. Initially, the first symptom to appear in a typical mumps infection is fever. Fever is the initial symptom and usually lasts for about 2 to 3 days. Fever is often associated with other prodromal symptoms like headache, vomiting and body pains. After an occurrence of fever, the next symptom to come is parotitis. Parotitis develops about 2 days after the onset of fever. Parotitis means inflammation of the parotid gland. So, there will be swelling and tenderness that is pain in the parotid. Usually, unilateral is the initial presentation. In Once infection uh, inflammation proceeds, 70% cases, there is bilateral involvement as well. So, mostly it begins as unilateral. One gland is affected before the other, but eventually in about 70%, both the glands will be affected. The glands will show painful swelling. There will be dry mouth in the child because there is a edema of Stenson's duct. And so, amount of... Uh, salivary fluid, the saliva which is needed, that is not able to reach the oral cavity and so you have features of dry mouth. Question can be asked, why dry mouth happens? Because of multiple reasons, inflamed, inflamed gut, more specifically, there is edema and stenosis involving the Stenson's duct as well. Stenson's duct is the duct of the, major duct of the parotid gland. And because there is dry mouth and there is a, you know, swelling which is developing, so there will be painful mastication, there will be difficulty in chewing in the patient. Plus, whatever side the gland is enlarging, same side referred ear pain. So, ipsilateral ear pain will also be characteristic. As I said, Stenson duct opening is found to be red and edematous if you uh, try to examine. A very important uh, history point is sour or acidic foods. When you take them, they tend to exacerbate pain. And that is why when we manage patients of mumps, we always advise bland food, soft, semi-solid food without there being any uh, spices in that. So, Indians love spices, we all love spices, but in general, we say that it should be, uh, usually we say that it should be a high carbohydrate, easy to digest, semi-solid kind of food. So, dals without tadka being added to them, rice over chapati, and more often we, we advise things like custards to be given to these children, because children tend to take them easily, they are energy rich, and they do not provoke pain when the child eats them. So, sour or acidic foods exacerbate pain. That is the basis of why we use bland diets in these patients. Then, as swelling increases in size, the angle of the jaw is obscured and the ear lobe is pushed upwards and outwards. So, mo positioning movement of the ear lobe is outwards and upwards. That is an important point that you need to remember. So, let us have a look at this image. This is a child who is having the classic features of parotitis. So, parotitis is happening in this child and uh, there is a unilateral swelling present in this, this child. When they give you a case scenario, they will not just give this photograph and ask you spot a diagnosis. There will always be history and there will be a photograph, which both of which will be complementing each other. Often what happens is, even as, even as uh, uh, residents, even as you know, uh, medical students, I get sometimes messages on Telegram or Facebook, people just take a photograph of a rash and they said, send it to me saying, sir, what is this? You can't make diagnosis like that. That's not how system actually works. In a real life patient, even in MCQ exam, you will not simply get a photograph without anything. Yes, there can be x-ray showing boot-shaped heart. Obviously, you will have to say that this is tetralogy of fallow. But other than that, if you get clinical picture, it will either be so characteristic that, for example, a molluscum contiguosum, you cannot go wrong with that. In case you are going wrong with that, then obviously you haven't seen molluscum contiguosum. It will be a very characteristic finding. Or other than that, if they get show you a case or there is a rash, they will always tell you that the child had fever with this onset, this rash was itchy or non-itchy, where did the rash first appear and then they will ask you the diagnosis. So similarly, when they will tell you swelling, they will say there was fever for two days, followed by third day, the child noticed a swelling as shown in the picture. The child is partially immunized or not immunized, something like that. What is the likely diagnosis? And then only you will be able to reach the diagnosis. So, this is a child who is having features of parotitis, which is unilateral. Moving further, 
the fever will last about 3 to 5 days and then without therapy it will come down. So, only symptomatic management for fever is needed. Swelling, the parotid swelling that peaks in about 3 days and subsides in 7 days. Sometimes the submandibular salivary gland may also be involved and Nelson actually says that in a small subset of patients, only submandibular salivary gland is involved without parotid involvement. But those cases are relatively rare. Our more biliform rash, measles like maculopapular rash may be seen in some of the individuals and edema may appear over the sternum due to lymphatic obstruction. These things are, you know, more described in literature than what you commonly see. But when you have a patient of mumps and you will find patients of mumps in your wards, you should be considerate about all these findings. They should be ruled out. They should be actively looked for and ruled out. If an immunized individual gets infection somehow, Usually, we find that the infection is less severe and parotitis is absent. This is important. Parotitis is not present in case of vaccinated individuals or vaccination failure. 